If Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. If you can point out a single unequivocal statement, a single unambiguous statement, anywhere from the Bible, in which Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, always just worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. Zakir Naik is very good at telling Muslims what they want to hear. His claims can sound powerful, until you realize that he simply dismisses everything in the Bible that disagrees with him. You have to follow what is in red letter. There are many things which are mentioned by Paul, which is not part of the sayings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If you know there is something like a red letter Bible, red letter Bible means whatever Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said is in red ink. If you quote me something in black ink, I will not believe. Why? That is not the word of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Dr. Nayak not only throws out everything written by the Apostle Paul, but also everything written by Peter, James, and Jude, along with the epistles of John. Once he's dismissed all these, he then rejects the bulk of what's left. He cast aside the Apostles' testimony that Jesus is God become man, that he was crucified, dead, and rose again. He only accepts the words highlighted in red, where the apostles are directly quoting Jesus. He pretends that he can use the apostles' quotations of Jesus to refute the other things that they said about him. Do you give more preference to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, or St. Paul? Jesus Christ. What I'm quoting to you is in red. Gospel of Matthew, note it down. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38. So don't get me a quotation of backing. To prove this wrong, you have to get me a quotation in reading. That's what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. In this instance, Dr. Nayak is trying to claim that Jesus' words in Matthew's Gospel contradict Matthew's claim that Jesus died. If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Bible in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38, when people come to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and tell him that, O oh, Master, show us some signs. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, replies, Ye evil and adulterous generation, seek it the after a sign, no sign shall be shown to you except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If Jonah was alive, for Jesus Christ to fulfill the prophecy, peace be upon him, he should be dead or alive. Dead or alive he should be. He should be alive. He should be alive and he was alive. Why do you say he was dead? Are you trying to say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, lied? If you say he was dead, that means you are saying Jesus was a liar, Nausbillah. That means Jesus was alive. What has been told to you by the church is wrong. Do you believe in the church or do you believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? But the Bible says Jesus was dead. Where does it say? Give me the reference. Every gospel writer says that Jesus died. But Dr. Nayak insists they're all wrong. Because if Jonah was alive in the belly of the fish, then Jesus had to be alive in the grave. Alive, 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 alive. Miracle of a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. Dr. Nayak is relying on the ignorance of his audience. Just five chapters later, Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. This is another direct quotation from Jesus. It's in the very same gospel. It requires no reading between the lines. Jesus explicitly said he would be killed and rise again the third day. It's in red letters, but like the rest of the Bible, Dr. Nayak simply dismisses it because it doesn't fit with the Quran. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 157, they killed him not, neither did they crucify him, it was only made to appear so. So Quran is clear, Wama katalu, wama salabu, they killed him not, neither did they crucify him. There's nothing in what Jesus said about the sign of Jonah to indicate that he wouldn't die, but simply that as Jonah was miraculously delivered on the third day, 
so would Jesus be. Not by being vomited out by a fish, but by the resurrection from the dead. It's not just Jesus' words in Matthew 17 that say he would die, but also his words in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20, and the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, and chapter 10, and the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, and the Gospel of John chapter 10. Every Gospel writer not only says that Jesus died, but quotes him as predicting it. John even quotes the risen Jesus as saying, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Simple, if Jonah was alive, Jesus Christ has to be alive, peace be upon him. If you say he was dead, that means you are saying Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, lied. That means he's not a man of God. It's not the Christians who are calling Jesus a liar, but Dr. Nayak and the author of the Quran. Dr. Nayak is trying to rewrite the New Testament because the Quran doesn't allow him to completely jettison it. It calls on the people of the Torah and Injil to evaluate the Quran by what it says there. The problem is that this doesn't make sense if the author of the Quran knew what was in the New Testament. The Quran says Jesus wasn't crucified and didn't die, but the whole New Testament insists that he was crucified and did die. Dr. Nayak tries to make the New Testament fit the Quran by editing it down only to the words of Jesus, but even this doesn't work. Jesus repeatedly and explicitly contradicts the Quran. Dr. Nike's attempts to divorce Jesus from his apostles are also refuted by the very words of Jesus. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. An apostle is one sent by Jesus. Jesus did not directly write a single word of the Bible, but he gave that work to his apostles. It was to these disciples that Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom, the power to bind and loose, to authoritatively declare the word of God. The apostles were eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry, and God gave them miraculous signs to attest to their authority. We don't get to edit their words to suit ourselves. So this brings us back to Dr. Nike's famous challenge. You can point out any unequivocal statement, any unambiguous statement from any version of the Bible in which Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says, worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. Any unequivocal statement, any unambiguous statement from the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says, worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity. A single unambiguous statement anywhere from the Bible in which Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. I, I am God, God or where he says, worship me, I am, I am ready to accept, accept Christianity, Christianity today. It doesn't matter to Dr. Nike that the apostles believed that Jesus was God and that they themselves died confessing that faith. It doesn't matter that even their Roman persecutors in the year 112, understood Christians to be worshiping Jesus as God. All that matters is Jesus is not recorded as explicitly saying, I am God, worship me. This supposedly proves the Quran. Jesus accepts worship in every gospel, but since he does not command it in red letters, Dr. Nike says that doesn't count. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, the Apostle Thomas calls Jesus my Lord and my God. Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Instead, he says, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Jesus' response is in red letters. He may allow himself to be called God, but since he didn't call himself God, that supposedly doesn't count either. Dr. Nike is correct that Jesus doesn't explicitly say, I am God, worship me. But what he did say about himself flies in the face of everything the Quran teaches. In Revelation chapter 1, 
Jesus calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And in Revelation chapter 21, God calls himself the same. Dr. Knight tries to avoid the implication. Now you are saying that because Jesus said I'm Alpha and Omega, therefore he's Almighty God, what do you mean Alpha and Omega? I'm the first and the last in what? Do you mean Jesus Christ was first in this world? No, he was born in a stable. Before him was his mother. There were many prophets that came before him. So surely he's not the first. The Jews made a similar accusation against Jesus. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus was born in that stable. Yet Jesus says he was before Abraham. He's also saying much more than that. He doesn't say before Abraham was, I was. But before Abraham was, I am. The Jews recognized that he was echoing God from Exodus chapter 3. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. When Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, the Jews took up stones to stone him. They explicitly accused him of making himself God. Dr. Nike is convinced that they and the disciples were all confused about him. He tells us that if we just focus on the red letters, we'll find that Jesus is merely the prophet the Quran says he is. So what does this word Alpha and Omega mean? It does not mean that he's first and the last, actually, literally. Because there were many people who came before him, and there were many people who came after him. What does it mean that in the law of God, whatever the messenger says, the law of God is first and last. At the time of Moses, Moses was Alpha and Omega as far as the law of God was concerned. Whatever he taught had to be followed. At the time of Jesus, Jesus cast peace be upon him. His teachings were Alpha and Omega. It had to be followed. At the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. His teachings are Alpha and Omega. It is the first and the last. The problem is not just what Jesus says in John chapter 8. What he says in John chapter 17 also shows this to be untrue. And now, O Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus goes on to say, For thou lovedst me before the foundation of the world. The Apostle John opens his gospel by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John goes on to say this word that already was in the beginning with God, and was God, became flesh as Jesus 2,000 years ago. Of course, Dr. Nike rejects all this. But even if we only believe the things Jesus said about himself, who is this Jesus who was before Abraham? glorified with the Father and loved by the Father before the world even began. John tells us he is God's only begotten Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Surah al ikhlas says that Allah neither begets nor is begotten. Begetting is a function of lower animals of sex. How can I attribute this function to Almighty God? Who did God have sex with? Who? That's the reason the scholars of Christianity, if you read the Revised Standard Edition, Revised Standard Version of the Bible, revised by 32 scholars, 
Christian scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 different corporate denominations. They say this word begotten in Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, is an interpolation, is a fabrication, is a concoction, and they're thrown out of the Bible. The issue is not of a concoction or fabrication, but of the translation of the Greek word monogonase. The editors of the Revised Standard Version did not translate monogonase as only begotten son, but Dr. Nike ignores how they did translate it. They rendered it to say that Jesus is God's only Son, a Son that is unique from all others. This flies in the face of what Dr. Knight loves to say about Jesus being the Son of God. In the Bible, God has got sons by the tons. Adam was the Son of God. Ephraim was the Son of God. Israel was the Son of God. All those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. So if you are a righteous person, you are a son of God. If I'm a righteous person, I'm a son of God. That is the language of the Bible. The Bible presents God as having many sons by adoption, but only Jesus is the Son of God by nature. This does not mean God had sex with Mary. The Bible makes clear she was a virgin. Rather, it is saying that there are distinct persons within the one eternal God, and there is a relationship between two of those persons that is analogous to that of a father and a son. Jesus is God become man. Not only does the Revised Standard Version contradict Dr. Nike about Jesus being just one of a multitude of sons, but it also describes Jesus as begotten of the Father. Everything Dr. Nike claims about Jesus falls apart if you will simply read the Bible for yourself. So what of Dr. Nike's claim that Muslims are better followers of Jesus than Christians? If Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. You know why? Because if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, he was circumcised on the eighth day. We Muslims are circumcised, Christians are circumcised. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he said that you have to follow each and every law of the Bible, each and every commandment. Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, verse number 17 to 20. If you break one law or jittle from the commandment, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. If you go to the Old Testament, clearly says in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 to 8. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse number 2 to 5, that you shall not have pork. Muslims don't have pork, but Christians have pork. So if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18, that thou shalt not have wine. It's mentioned in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1. Wine is a mocker. You should not have wine. Muslims don't have alcohol, but the Christians have alcohol. Dr. Nike sets forth circumcision, the eating of pork and the drinking of wine as the test of following Jesus' teachings. Let's look at them one by one. He cites Ephesians 5.18 as Jesus saying that Christians should not drink wine. It's worth noting that Ephesians is not quoting Jesus. It was written by the Apostle Paul, whom Dr. Nike rejects. Not only that, but it doesn't say what Dr. Nike says it does. Paul was saying not to be drunk with wine, but he does not forbid drinking wine in moderation. The other text Dr. Nike cites Similarly warns of the dangers of drunkenness, but the Bible repeatedly calls wine a blessing from God and calls men to enjoy it in moderation. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household, and the Levite that is within thy gates. In the Gospel of John, chapter 2, Jesus' first miracle is turning water into wine for a wedding celebration. Dr. Nike ignores all this, because once again, he is trying to remake Jesus to fit the Quran, which he understands to prohibit wine, even in moderation. But what about eating pork? It's true that Jesus did not eat pork. In Leviticus 11, God prohibited Israel from eating unclean animals, including the pig. But Dr. Nike ignores the rest of what the Bible says. Animals had been identified as clean and unclean thousands of years earlier in the time of Noah. But after the flood, 
Noah was explicitly told he could eat them all. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. The prohibition against eating unclean animals was only given in the time of Moses. It was when God set Israel apart as his holy people. He also forbade them from wearing clothes of mixed fibers, sowing with mixed seed and plowing with a mixed team. In addition, the Jews were also commanded to make regular sacrifices in God's tabernacle. All of these things were unique to Israel and passed away with Jesus' death and resurrection. Just as the temple and its sacrifices ended, so did the prohibition on eating pork. The Revised Standard Version that Zakir Knight praises so much has Jesus declaring all foods clean in the Gospel of Mark. But Dr. Knight says that Muslims are the true followers of Jesus by contradicting him. Dr. Knight is purposely misleading his audiences. He cites verses 7 and 8 in Leviticus 11 to prohibit the eating of pork, but he ignores that the very same chapter also declares a host of other animals unclean, which he proclaims clean. Leviticus 11 presents the pig as haram, but also the camel. Dr. Knight not only considers camels halal, but recommends drinking their milk and their urine. Once again, he is seeking to defend Islam, since the Quran says camels are halal, and a hadith has Muhammad recommending their milk and urine. Jesus never ate pork, but he also never ate or drank anything from a camel. Remember, this is what Dr. Nayak said about those who would eat pork. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that you have to follow each and every law of the Bible, each and every commandment, Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, verse number 17 to 20. If you break one law or jittle from the commandment, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. According to Dr. Nike, Christians aren't going to heaven because they eat pork, contrary to verses 7 and 8 of Leviticus 11. But that same standard would also condemn him and the author of the Quran for ignoring the other restrictions of Leviticus 11. It's a self-serving reading of God's Word. Besides abstaining from wine and pork, Dr. Nike points to circumcision as a mark of truly following Jesus. Like the prohibition on pork, he fails to recognize the reason it was commanded in the first place. Circumcision was given to Abraham as a sign of the covenant that God made with him and his people after him. For 2,000 years, God dealt primarily with the Jews, but the coming of Jesus brought a new kingdom made up of people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Gentiles were no longer required to become Jews to come to God. In the Acts of the Apostles, God gave a vision to Peter to make this all clear. He fell into a trance and saw a heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Immediately after this vision, the Spirit told Peter that three Gentiles sought him, and he was to go with them. He proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ to these Gentiles. They believed and showed forth miraculous signs just as the Jewish Christians had at Pentecost. Just as Dr. Knight does today, some in the early church taught that circumcision and a prohibition on eating pork were still required. In Acts chapter 15, Peter and the other apostles gathered for a council, and they declared the following. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, 
that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Dr. Nike will often cite Jesus' words against the Pharisees. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. Dr. Nike seems to think that what the Pharisees needed was more rules. But Jesus said the Pharisees were like whitewashed tombs. They were beautiful on the outside, but full of corruption on the inside. We need more than a longer list of rules. We need what Jesus called the new birth. God tells us in the Bible that we have three big problems. Our hearts are rebellious. God calls them desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. We are told that we have serpents' hearts and hearts of stone. We also have a sinful past where we have broken God's commandments over and over. The God of the Bible is just and must punish sin. He cannot simply forgive and forget. And finally, we have a poisonous life. We are unclean, and all we touch becomes unclean. The good news of the gospel is the great exchange. Jesus nails our heart of stone to the cross and gives us a new heart that loves him. He bears our sins to the cross and pays their penalty so that we can have his righteous life counted to us. He nails our poisonous life to the cross and puts his Holy Spirit within us. For all Dr. Nike's fast talking, the gospel is not about clean and unclean animals, but about God justly punishing sin, yet saving his people. It's not about circumcision of the flesh, but cutting away the uncleanness of our hearts. It's not about drinking alcohol, but about a new birth and being filled with the Holy Spirit. We have made another video that helps sort out what the Bible actually says from what others say about it. It's available free at www.quran.video. Zakir Naik is very good at telling you what you want to hear. Our plea to you is to watch our video and then read the Bible for yourself. Don't take Zakir Naik's word, nor our word, for what is true. Read the words of those you admit were the prophets of God in the Bible and obey them as they point you to a Jesus who is far, far more than a prophet. Thank you.